Hey everybody, morning. I uh, hope you guys can hear me okay. We're gonna continue on talking about we're gonna, we're gonna continue talking about uh, hurricanes this morning. So last week, uh, everybody can hear me okay? Joe, good. You guys can hear me? Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, last week we talked about um, sort of general intro stuff, uh, you know, sort of conceptual um, factors that can lead to the formation of hurricanes, et cetera. But now I want to run us through an example. And I think the, the classic modern example, <clears throat> and not just the classic modern hurricane example, but I think what's actually become the uh, incredibly important to the thinking, um, uh, conceptualization, and sort of societal take on disasters, and that is a Hurricane Katrina. So this was 2005. Um, obviously, we've had many hurricanes before, many hurricanes since, but the magnitude of this and the um, visceral response on so many dimensions um, to an area, one, that that was vulnerable, but two, to an area that um, really is so iconic and important to our American story um, was also a huge part of this. Uh, and, uh, and then it spilled into politics and it got just totally crazy. Um, in addition to just the, the outright uh, death and, and, and immediate suffering from the disaster. So with that, let's talk a little bit about Hurricane Katrina. Again, as always, you guys interrupt me if something doesn't make sense or if I'm talking too fast or or what have you. I guess I have to advance this way over here. Okay, so uh, Hurricane Katrina obviously hit in the late summer of 2005 and really sunk the city. So this picture here is from the New York Times and we're looking at um, the downtown area of the city, the, the, the business area of the city, um, what's, what's actually called, now the, the city is built around a river. So the uptown downtown part doesn't always really work. People in this part of the world talk about upriver or downriver. In this area that we would all from the rest of the country call the downtown, they call the CBD or the central business district. The big uh, giant um, uh, sort of semi-circular um, uh, structure right there in front of us, sort of middle left right here. This is the big giant football stadium. It looks this way because in 2005 it had been damaged by winds. So some of the, the, the covering and the sheetings had been ripped off. Um, this is the uh, basketball stadium where the, where the Hornets play. Or sorry, the Pelicans play when I say the Hornets. Um, and, uh, and then we're looking um, essentially from the north to the south. And this structure right here is the Mississippi River Bridge. The, the Mississippi River is right here, uh, sort of just on the other side of these tall buildings from our perspective here. So let's talk about, now is anybody, is anybody on the, uh, listening in been to New Orleans before? I was just there yeah. a few months ago. I was like, or if Joe's trying to talk, I think you're muted. If you're, Joe's trying to say something. So, so I, it sounds like nobody has been to New Orleans. If that, that's, that's cool. I hope you guys all take the opportunity to go. I think you so. Can you come with us uh, with, a, with a class or you can go on your own. But I, I, I would highly encourage you guys to consider checking out this um, really awesome part of our uh, American tapestry. So let's talk about, talk about the context before we get to the storm. Let's make sure we understand the setup and the the background of um, the pre-storm uh, area. First and foremost, this area is defined by environmental threats, environmental constraints. This is a very wet area. This is a deltaic, low-lying area, um, historically exposed to seasonal flooding every year in the spring flood season. Uh, a lot of you know, semi, semi wet, semi dry type of environment. So all kinds of challenges through the human settlement of this uh, period. Um, and in the, in the sort of the context of Katrina's impacts, um, 
we're real uh, society is increasingly frustrated with all of these threats from the environment by and large and we begin developing increasing abilities to manipulate the natural world and to change things and to exert our control through uh, engineering and other technologies and so these two things um, are coming together this is a, a picture from or a, a etching from 1863 so now we're looking at uh, now we're up river and we're looking down river so this is the mississippi river it's flowing from your view down forward to go to the ocean this area here is called lake pontchartrain it's called lake pontchartrain but it's not technically a lake it's actually a, a small pocket of the ocean so there's a connection to the the gulf of mexico so it's not technically a lake it's it's uh, not fresh water anything like that um why is New Orleans where it is? It's, New Orleans is located where it is because the original European explorers um, spied some Native American uh, uh, folks that were going on the main river. So, so the French found the river and they were exploring up the river and they were looking for a place to establish a fort trading post where they could um, uh, establish it and it wouldn't get flooded out. So they were going upriver to find the first place that was dry year round, basically. And they could have put it, you know, in several different places, but they picked this place because there was a portage. Portage is where you you um, come out from the river to go around a, an obstruction or, or, or to move around. In this case, the portage went from right here, the Mississippi River, over to here, Lake Pontchartrain, where there was awesome uh, uh, mussels and fishing and all kinds of stuff. So because they found this uh, essentially Native American trail, not Native American highway, if you will, um, they said, this looks like a good place. And they and they plopped down. And that's why New Orleans is where it is. Uh, the oldest part of the town is called the French Quarter. You guys might have heard of that. Uh, and the French Quarter, uh, you see right here in this image, is, is the... Uh, um, the original epicenter of the town, and then everything, and now we refer to that area, that part of the French Quarter, the heart of the French Quarter is Jackson Square, and the, the city evolves around it. So this is all wetland. This is all forested wetland, bottomland hardwood forest, cypress trees, things like that. Um, and so, so okay, sorry, just so I'm, I'm being clear here. So I say cypress trees, I mean, like, uh, you know, 100, 200 foot uh, tall closed canopy um, swamps. Um, so big honking trees that live for a long, at least, at least some of the foundational trees live for a long time. We have some in our research sites there that are uh, from the 1700s um, and some can clearly live longer than that. So we're talking, you know, hundreds of year old trees, big honking trees and an area that's wet sometime of the year, dry sometime of the year. But the reason the city is established here, and, and so if you have a look right here, even though this is 1863, we see there's lots of, we might not be able to see what it is, maybe with the quality of your Zoom uh, link that you're watching this video over, but, but um, there's structures, okay? There's, there, there, there's human structures here. And they're right up tight against the river. As we go farther away from the river, we still have structures, but they become a little bit less abundant, a little, little bit less abundant. And as soon as we get out to over here, uh, not much stuff. If we look on the other bank, um, what we see here is the same, it's called the West Bank, same kind of idea, right? So there's some structures here, but as soon as we start to get away, uh, the structures start to disappear. Why is that? That's because due to the natural flooding and, and the natural rising and lowering of floodwaters and sediment deposition processes that happen naturally every year, there's a natural levee, there's a natural lip around the riverbank. And so that means this area is more elevated than the surrounding area. This means that it's higher. So this means that it is ironically, the area right next to the river is the driest um, relative to these other areas. So that's why, New Orleans is where it is, and that's why um, it, it started where it is, and that's why it spread as it did. So check it out. So it spreads up, you know, down river and up river, not as fast, um, you know, away from the river. So people, the early development of this part of the country 
is constrained by the hydrology, by their hydrology. Um, and this really is frustrating. It's frustrating because there are uh, outbreaks of infectious disease, yellow fever is the classic one all the time. Um, and uh, it, it has all kinds of implications for um, uh, slavery and for who's the, how the power structure flows and all of these things. Um, and it, it takes a while for folks to actually understand what about the swamp, what about the wetlands is threatening, primarily uh, uh, vector-borne diseases with that vector mostly being mosquitoes or, or frequently being mosquitoes. Uh, at the time, 1600s, 1700s, early 1800s, we talk about miasmas. So people just think, oh, swamp gas. This is swamp sometimes smells weird because it's anoxic. Um, it has anoxic soils, uh, many do. And so therefore it smells bad. So it must be something about the air. So that's what the theory was. Regardless, people understood that there's something about the wetlands inherently that are threatening, is threatening to their health and also just logistically to move around as hard when you're walking through muddy stuff. So for all these reasons, logistics reasons and health reasons, um, there's this desire to push back the natural world, to shove back the wetlands. And so the way that's most frequently done, um, starting you know, as far back as the Chinese and the Romans, was to, to dig ditches and allow the water to more easily drain out. And so that's what happens. So we start uh, in the 1800s, there starts to be aggressive efforts to drain the area around, oh, sorry, I didn't probably, I didn't probably orient you. So this is, um, so if you can see right here, we're kind of on this, this bend. Uh, this is not a great drawing, but we're kind of on a bend here. So we're on this bend. So New Orleans also has the nickname, the Crescent City. The Crescent City comes from this, this crescent, this curve, um, uh, bend in the river. Um, so, so there we go. So this is where the city of New Orleans is. And so this effort is to, to, to try to drain. So th these are uh, elevational um, uh, topographic map here. So this is marking the elevation. So the, the, as the lines get tighter and tighter together, this is, this is steeper and steeper and higher ground. So we see the highest ground right here by the river. And so this other area, this intermediary area, let's dig some ditches in here and let's drain and pull the water away. So that's how we start with some really aggressive engineering. And then this gets uh, even more sophisticated in the early 1900s. And by the early 1900s, the US, specifically New Orleans, is the world leader in dealing with and applying technologies to deal with hydrology, to deal with flooding. Uh, we are far from the leaders in this technology. We're, we're one of the worst in the world now to deal with flooding and, and such. Um, and certainly when it comes to innovating things to deal with flooding, we are really dead last. But at this point in the early 1900s, we were the world leader. One of the reasons we were the world's leader were these things, these, these wood pumps or wood screws, named not because they're made out of wood, but for the inventor whose name was wood. So what these are, these are these, these ultra high efficient pumps and these are invented and deployed in New Orleans to um, drain the city, to constantly 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, be pumping out the city. And if you guys come with us to New Orleans next year, you'll see as we drive around the town, you'll see some areas have these just big giant um, siphon tubes just sort of coming out of the concrete and, and going into other sections. So with these pumps that were designed to run ultra efficiently and run all the time, as opposed to something like a, a flood pump or something like uh, you know your toilet or something that sort of flows water when you flush it. Um, this is flowing all the time. And what it's doing is pumping out the water. So in New Orleans, regular time, we go to New Orleans, take a shovel, start digging in before we had these, these wood screws pumping. And within a foot or two, you would hit water. So that's how close the subsurface water is to where you step. And so by employing these po pumps, just like you stick a straw into a, a, a soda or a cup of juice and suck you're, you're suck, you're lowering that water level, we're pulling the water down. And so it reduces the likelihood of flooding 
And it also means more area. It also means more of this area as we get over this way can be drained, right? And so um, it's, it's uh, regardless if it's raining or not raining, it makes the area drier and more usable. Despite all these great advances, um, in the early part of the 1900s, we're, we still experienced some significant flooding. We talked a little bit about uh, flooding a few weeks ago, um, but suffice it to say, flooding a huge problem. And again, Miss the Mississippi River drains about 40% of the whole of the U.S., right, of, of the, the 48 states, I should say. That's a huge amount of the country. So all of that country, rain fa drops falling wherever on that that area, that catchment, is going to go down to Louisiana. So this is a huge river. This is a huge um, seasonal flood. And so we had some particularly bad ones in the um, 1920s. This is one in, in 27. This is some stuff in 28, where we're seeing flooding in Florida and all over the place. And so this is this builds this huge interest in, in changing the river and starting to, to think about um, managing the river as we might manage a house or, 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 or start starting to dictate how material and energy flows to this system as we would in a skyscraper or a school or something that we design. Um, and so people really start to get, uh, get behind this idea of, of dictating how the river will behave as opposed to responding to the river. Um, and so we start levying the Mississippi, uh, which causes all kinds of problems. As we, as we mentioned in their flood uh, discussion, rivers need to jump out of their channels, right? That's just how things work, right? That, 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 that's an inherent part of our ecosystem and, and life in and around riparian systems for millions, actually billions of years. But we don't like that. We've decided we don't like that. So we're going to change this billion year of history. And so we started putting these levees, these, these um, dams that run along the river as opposed to across the river. Um, and that has the effect, if you recall, of shoving up the water and making, when the water does flood, it gets way higher, tends to flow much faster, scours more, uh, as opposed to jumping out of the channel, slowing down and dropping sediment. That nourishment of sediment is also the reason why deltaic areas um, at the end of rivers are so productive because they have such good constantly being rejuvenated with good new soil, good new sediment deposition. And we've also cut that, uh, cut that out of the picture. Okay, so th some other things happen. I'm, I'm sort of skipping around here. Um, but then we jump forward to 1965. 1965, Hurricane Betsy comes in. And here's the storm track of Hurricane Betsy. And if you recall from uh, our discussion last time, this is this is, this is not the predicted, it's not the model storm track, this is the observed. So while before we were talking about these spaghetti diagrams as to where we thought the hurricanes might go, after the fact, we can now go and look in the hurricane uh, historical archives and, and see the actual track. So each of these different dots here represents a given day in the, the history of this hurricane. And the, uh, in, the warmth of the dots indicates the strength of the the storm uh, measured by wind speed. And so as it gets hotter and hotter, the wind speed gets more and more. And as we have more cool colors, that means the wind speed is lower. And when the, the um, uh, symbols change to triangles, we're no longer a, a storm at that point. It's just sort of a, a unconsolidated uh, system. Um, anyway, so as we know, her, uh, in the, for Atlantic hurricanes at least, they tend to come out of from Africa or from sort of the middle part of the Atlantic, and they come in and they head towards the American coast. And that's what this, that's what Betsy did. So she came up, boom, 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 kind of turned course, boop, went up here, looked like they're, she was going to hit the Carolinas, paused, flipped back to around, flipped, sort of did a, did a uh, kind of, a, a, what would that be, a 270 or so, kind of room, and then went and first struck Florida went across the, the Southern Florida and the Keys, and then went up and right by New Orleans. Now, again, we can tell this is New Orleans. Well, I can tell because I go there, but, but you guys can tell. So here's, here's Louisiana. Even if you don't have a map, you can see the Mississippi River here. Oh, I, I hope you guys can see that with the resolution on Zoom. I hope you guys can see that. Um, but regardless, here's that big giant lake 
that borders New Orleans. So if you're ever wondering where New Orleans is, look for Lake Pontchartrain. And, and, if, and that, should, uh, that should help you. So anyway, so this one, so as we can tell, this storm came pretty much just about over the city of New Orleans. The eye came just about over the city of New Orleans, 1965. Huge impacts from this. Um, lots of damage, lots of destruction. So one of the things that happens is the US Congress responds by creating the Flood Control Act of 1965. So it did a few things, but in the context of our story today, what that did was give fuel. So there already were some, some levees, some, some sort of basic flood control structures in and around the city of New Orleans and other parts of Louisiana, but this was rocket fuel. So this went to the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers is kind of a funky, funky agency. It's um, headed by military. But the vast majority of the people that work there are civilian employees. So when you hear Army Corps of Engineers, it sounds like a military organization, um, but it's really primarily not, even though the, the leadership is um, from the Department of Defense. The Army Corps of Engineers was the entity within the Army when the country got started that did, the, as it says, the, the engineering, primarily things like bridges, and then because harbors and ports were so important to the history of our country, they were the entity that also made sure that we could dredge out the, the harbor and get ships in for commerce and, or, or military purposes, that kind of stuff. And so because of a, a weird history, they ended up becoming the entity whenever we wanted to do something engineering a river or a port, they became the entity that sort of dealt with it. And now they are the entity that deals with things related to flooding, dam building, et cetera. So when this act passes in 1965, it, it charges the Army Corps of Engineers to build a flood protection system for the city of New Orleans so that this, so what happened in 1965 won't ever happen again is the charge. Um, now, this is a huge source of controversy and we could spend an entire class talking about nothing but this act and what happened with Katrina. So I will not spend the entire rest of the semester talking about Katrina as I am want to do. But, um, but essentially what happened, the charge was from 1965, um, uh, go and build a flood protection system around the urban center of New Orleans that would withstand a category three hurricane, a direct hit from a category three hurricane. Um, when Hurricane Katrina will, will ultimately strike as we'll see in a little bit in 2005, uh, this, this construction was not yet done. So even though it started in 65, it wasn't done yet. And while Hurricane Katrina, we'll see at one point was a category five, right? The, the strongest storm uh, or, or, or the strongest wind speeds that we have in terms of our hurricane scale. But by the time it actually made landfall, it was a category three. By the time it ultimately gets to the city of New Orleans, it's a category one hurricane. So one of the very, very common falsehoods that is perpetuated by folks like some of the folks at the Army Corps of Engineers is saying, well, you know, we couldn't save New Orleans because we didn't design it. We, we weren't, we didn't design the thing. We weren't charged with designing it to, a, to, to defend against a hurricane five category. It was not a hurricane five category. Katrina was a hurricane three when it made landfall, category one when it went over the city. It should have well been able to, the flood protection system should have well been able to repel any serious major damage and it absolutely catastrophically would fail. So more on that in a bit. Okay, so we have that hurricane in 1965. Then we have Camille, which is, um, I, I think it's still the second strongest. So there's all these different metrics. We can talk about strength and intensity and size and everybody loves to have their, their measurement. If we talk about just sort of the wind speed aspect of strength, Camille, I believe is still the second strongest Atlantic hurricane that's ever made landfall. So it was a very strong hurricane. So we just pat, we had this impact. People in New Orleans were whacked. They, uh, they thought, okay, we got some help and the help's on the way. And then they got whacked again right, 1969, and uh, uh, really bad, and uh, so these folks are all displaced. These are all folks that are at this um, uh, uh, 
government office because their houses were destroyed. So they're looking for a place to sleep. They're looking for a place to get some food, et cetera. And this happened throughout the region. Um, okay, uh, so questions so far? I, I'm talking a lot. Um, everything making sense, you guys? Or, or do you have any questions so far? Um, I just had one. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Oh, so, oh, sorry. Maybe, maybe it was I couldn't hear you guys, so my speaker was messed up. So sorry, Caitlin, ask again. Sorry. Oh yeah, I just said I have one. Um, when you were talking about the the wood screws pumps, uh -huh. um, so they would um, like remove the pump out the water to reduce flooding. Where would they put that water? Great question. So the question is, so so here's the city, say, or or, or the downtown part of the city, let's say. Um, or I guess the, on this diagram, it's this other way. So, um, you know, so water's all here. So we're sucking out, where do we put it? And the answer is into these canals. Um, so, so this is a, the, I have some diagrams about this later on, but, it, and it's confusing for us to think about this, but um, this is an extremely, extremely, extremely flat part of the country. So it's pancake land. So we, we see movies and people talk about like the high school kids go up and drink on the water tower. That's because there's nowhere to get height. So the water tower in town is usually the highest structure for maybe hundreds of miles around. Um, and so everything's very flat. The river here, so, so this, I mentioned Lake Pontchartrain, right? Lake Pontchartrain is, is an outpocketing of the sea. So that means it's at sea level, okay? By definition, the river here is flowing into the sea. So by definition, the Mississippi River is a higher elevation than is the ocean, right? Because gravity is, is, is dragging that water down to ultimately flush out into the Gulf of Mexico. And so what that means is this water here, even though we look straight down and it, it just looks about the same, this is actually higher, the, the water level here is higher elevation than right here. So therefore the idea is these are these drainage canals. The idea is these drainage canals, if we make, the, make it easier for water to flow, this, this area will tend to leak water down this way and it'll dribble out into Lake Pontchartrain. So when they put the wood screws in, they just dump a lot more water into those canals. So what they do is they, they rise up the, they raise up the canals. So instead of being just say a, a, an excavated pit in the ground, they're now a box that goes above the ground, throw a bunch of water in, and then that water is going to gravity dribble and, and you build it such that this part of the canal is, the bottom of the canal is higher and then it's lowest right here, that's, that water will gravity feed down. So what we do is we put these wood screws around, we suck the water out, and, and that's why, if you guys ever come with me or you see pictures, that's why, that's why it's like this, right? So the water goes up and over some structure. So here we're sucking it out of the groundwater in the city. Here is a, a, a wall, concrete or whatever st structures, and then it's being dumped into this area. And this is a cross section of a canal. And it's, it's just going to flow down to the to Lake Pontchartrain. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Thank you. Um, okay, cool. Do those screws, are those like, those are still there? They still run? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they've, they've upgraded them in the 100 years since. But, but yes, absolutely. These, these pumps, these, this basic design is used all around the world. Um, and, and it's what the Dutch use. It's what... Uh, whoever is trying to deal with long-term draining of areas, uh, either the, the, these, I think they've, they've, you know, refined them over the years, but, but this basic approach um, was uh, groundbreaking, was, was amazingly um, effective. Um, so yeah, definitely. That's cool. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. If you go back to that last image. This one? Uh, yeah. So like okay. the margins of the Lake Pontchartrain, are those contour lines or is that just like a like a ripple? Yeah. Like right here? Uh, no. Uh, the here? margins of the lake. Uh, oh, right around here. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think that's, uh, I'm not positive. I haven't looked too closely at this one, but I think that's depth. Yeah. So whereas this is the contour lines of you know, in the air of the, of the soil surface. I think this is the depth, this okay. is the contour lines of the, of the underwater uh, area. Yeah. Okay, thanks. 
Cool. Anybody else? Anything else? I, sorry, I guess you guys were talking before and I couldn't hear. So you might have asked a question that I, I jerkily ignored. Yeah, real quick. Uh, why do we make those drainage systems out of concrete and not just like dig them out? Wouldn't it help more with water <laughs> suck back up into the earth? Yeah, good question. So originally they did just dig them out. Um, so originally it was just literally picks and shovels and, and, and dig a trench, basically. Um, uh, I think that, well, there's various reasons, one of which uh, people want to maximize the usage of the land, right? And so if this is, if there's a bunch of water flowing through this area, that means that it's going to be probably pretty wet if it's just um, soil. And that means it's going to tend to erode eventually over time, especially, I mean, maybe not if we just did it like this to have, a, have gravity drain and do nothing else. But if we're starting to pump water in, right, every day of the year, 365 days of the year, and, and have it basically be a flowing river, it's eventually going to, to erode that. So one, it's, it just will erode. Uh, two, people want to have maximum usage of this area. So they want to build right up to the edge. They want to put houses there or whatever. And then what ultimately happens now, if you guys come with me, you won't see many canals. So they will eventually, actually, in addition to just having concrete sides and bottoms, put a concrete top on it and essentially make them a culvert. And so, so now streets go over these. And actually, these are uh, usually the medians, the, the, the middle part are what um, folks in New Orleans call the neutral ground uh, between one side of a street and another side of a street. So uh, now you, most of the canals you cannot see. So where we work, our, uh, we have a project down over here um, and those canals are exposed. So those canals you can see, you drive around, you see a canal, but here in the main part of New Orleans, you don't see canals because they're covered. Okay. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah, makes sense. Cool, other questions? Okay, let's keep going. So where were we? Uh, okay, so talk about flooding, flooding, flooding. Okay, okay. Camille hits in sixty nine, and this really uh, gets everybody going. So um, the last really, really devastating hurricane that hit New Orleans before Katrina is nineteen sixty nine. Is Camille right? So this is. I know I'm old. I know you guys know I'm old, but this was actually shockingly older than me. Yes, it's true. This hurricane is older than I am. Um, so. Uh, what happened, and again, that we see this with wildfires, right? We've seen this with flooding. We see this, all these things, that when these events aren't particularly frequent, people get um, complacent, right? People think, ah, it's not a problem. And so, so bef you heard a lot in the wake of Katrina, or in the le let's actually say before Katrina, people say, yeah, I'm not too worried about hurricanes, P people in New Orleans specifically. Um, and so, you know, after Katrina, you hear people say, when the devastation and everything unfolds, they say things like, oh my God, you know, I couldn't believe it. It was, it was so amazing. I mean, like, like I'm, I'm 30 years old and I, we never had anything like this before, right? That type of thinking is understandable perhaps, but again, completely wrong. And that's because we've imposed a political and static view over the landscape. So this is how most people think of the Gulf Coast, right? We think of it as a map of Texas, a map of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, right? We, and so we think, oh, this is this is the geography, right? And maybe Texas has a way to deal with hurricanes or Texas has a, a protocol to evacuate people or whatever the heck, but Louisiana is something different and Florida is something different, right? That that political structure is, is a joke when it comes to dealing with natural disasters because the disasters don't really don't really care. So again, here's Betsy in 65, right? That would that would induce the the um, Army Corps of Engineers to start working on the flood control, uh, the flood protection system. Um, so we have this this uh, path. But since that 65 to Katrina, this is these are all the tropical storms and hurricanes, right? So this area is lousy with storms, right? So that's just a fact. So just because we've been lucky, let's say if we have a house in New Orleans, just because we're lucky that we haven't got a direct hit in a few decades, you know, count our blessings, but that in no way says that we're not going to be hit. And indeed, before Katrina hit, some of my friends from uh, college who 
uh, moved to New Orleans and were working in and around Louisiana, um, said, you got to come, dude, you got to come to Mardi Gras because, and it was, it was widely known amongst folks that understood these things that it said the next big hurricane that hits New Orleans, city's done. City's completely done. So you should come now. <laughs> you should come eat barbecue and come have fun now because it, it ain't going to be here forever is, was the, uh, was the implication of that. Why now? Why is that? Okay, again, this is this is all lead up to. I know this is a long lead up, but but uh, this is important lead up. So we have all this human engineering stuff going on. One of the consequences of all that engineering is the fact that we're robbing the wetlands of sediment. So let me orient you guys to this again. So here, this black squiggly line. This is the Mississippi River. Okay. Here is the so-called Bird's Foot Delta. This is where the Mississippi River floods out into the Gulf of Mexico. Here is Lake Pontchartrain. Here's our big orientation uh, point. Uh, so all this black over here is the ocean. Black over here is the ocean, 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 ocean. Um, and so again, we can see New Orleans. Here's Lake Pontchartrain. Here's that big crescent, that big bend. So there we know. So, that, so now we, we've oriented ourselves. And this, this, this map, I need to update it. This is, this is um, a few years old, but, but serves the point here. So the point is, uh, if we talk about the coastal, the immediate coastal area of Louisiana, and that's illustrated by the blue bounding line, um, we're screwed. We're, it's, we've lost a greater quantity of wetland than anywhere else in the US over the last several decades. And so this has been visualized here. So this is the amount of loss from 1932 to 2000 is red. So all this red here um, represents area that used to be emergent wetland. So, so swamps, grasslands, marshes. And, and as a reminder, swamp is a woody vegetated wetland. A marsh is an herbaceous plant dominated wetland. So if there's grasses and grass-like things, we call that a marsh. Uh, in our part of the world, we call those salt marshes, right? If it's dominated by trees, we call that a swamp um, or a bottomland hardwood forest is a more technical term, but, but swamps and marshes. So generally speaking, right out at the salt water, we get marshes as we come further inland and, and we get less influence of, of salt water, we get more of the tree type structures. Okay, so as we look around, all of this red has eroded away and gone, disappeared. Uh, the yellow, I mean, now we're 20 years in, right? So, but, but the yellow, when this was first drafted, um, it predicts the amount of loss over the 50 years from 2000 to 2050. So essentially the yellow and red is area that's gone or is soon to be gone. The greens indicate the gains. So the greens indicate the area where sediment was added such that um, the level of the benthos um, emerged above uh, the intertidal, above mean sea level, and has become terrestrial. And so uh, we see that, and this, is, this area is called the um, uh, Atchafalaya Basin, um, where we have some of these things going on. We do have some green at the, at the bird's foot delta, but it's very, very small. It's very, very small. Indeed, it is so small that um, uh, it's, it's, it changes almost yearly. I can see the change almost yearly as we go now. Um, so we work, so you guys come with us, we work in New Orleans, which is where we're focusing. We also work down here in uh, what's called lower, this is called uh, Plaquemines Parish. Parish, they have parishes instead of counties in Louisiana because they're Louisiana. Um, uh, and um, this parish just below Orleans Parish is called Plaquemines. So we work down here in in the city, and so we go down here a lot. And so over the over the years, we've seen it change. So here's here's uh, numbers. Now these numbers are a few years old, several years old actually now, but they still tell the story. So um, half over half of the loss of all the wetlands across all of the lower 48 states um, has occurred in the one state of Louisiana. So it is we're, we're bleeding wetlands. Um, if we talk about the percentage of wetland that we lost. So the percentage of wetlands that we had say 150 years ago versus the amount of wetlands that we have now, Louisiana leads the country in the greatest quantity of wetlands lost 
you and I here in California have the unfortunate distinction of having the greatest proportional loss. So we didn't, we've, in California, we've never had the extent of wetlands as our friends in Louisiana have had, but um, we've lost a greater amount of what we did have. So we've lost 91%. So, so your factoids here are, um, are uh, overall, the lower 48, state has, lower 48 states have lost about 54% of our wetlands over the last 150 years. Louisiana has lost just a bit under 50%. We in California have lost 91%. You can remember the millions of hectares that have lost, but I, I tend to find the percentages more helpful and easier to remember. So overall, a bit more than half in the US. Louisiana, just slightly under half. California, 91%. And this is just an image showing uh, Cal uh, San Francisco Bay and most of this gray stuff that's now concrete was wetlands before we started uh, messing with those, for example. Okay, this is what that wetland loss looks like um, in Louisiana. So this is, these are some of our students from Channel Islands in our, in our normal um, uh, springtime class. We it couldn't go last year. We can't go this year, obviously, because of COVID. But, but um, so what are we doing? We're, so we're here now near the... Um, this picture is taken sort of, uh, so here's New Orleans. This picture is taken down around, uh, around where this, uh, where I'm sort of moving the, the uh, cursor. And what are we looking at? So I'm on a road, I'm taking a picture. So our students are here, uh, RJ sticking his head down, um, uh, looking for crawdads, or I don't know what the heck he's doing. Um, and what we see here is water. This is, if you were to taste this, this is salt water. This is basically, um, um, ocean water or very close to ocean water. What is these? These are cypress trees. Okay, there's a cormorant hanging out in that cypress tree. These are cypress trees. Now, cypress trees are amazingly cool trees. The closest relative is our coast redwood. So if you come with us and look at the needles, you'll think it's a redwood. It, the needles look just like um, something you'd see up in Big Sur or, or something. Anyway, uh, big, huge trees. But these trees look a little funky, right? They look a little funky because they're all dead. Um, cypress trees can withstand being in a day. They can withstand being in a wetland and being submerged for a long, for months and months and months at a time, right? So they're really cool trees. But they can withstand being submerged for a long period of time. They are not a purely aquatic plant, meaning they, uh, the seeds, for example, need to land on dry ground and start to germinate and start to grow before they can withstand being, being uh, underwater. And what's going on here is if I had taken this picture 20 years before, this would all be grassy, this would all be marsh, this would all be emergent uh, uh, land, this would be wetland, right? But what's happened? Um, the cutting off of the sediment supply by levying the Mississippi to try to deal with flooding has not allowed that, that sediment to come over and be deposited onto the marsh plain. So as there's natural subsidence, we'll talk about that in a slide or so, but as the, as the natural soil compresses and goes down, um, uh, there's nothing to, to add on. So there's normally, we're in some type of equilibrium. So most of our coastal plains are in an equilibrium where we have a bit of compression, loss, um, the, the, the dead plant materials breaking down, degrading, and so the soil is compacting. But then we have this annual addition of sediment from the seasonal floods. And so it basically evens out for most years. That, that's totally gone away in Louisiana. So now we have these big giant trees in some places, but none of those trees are having babies. There's no seedlings that are coming around. So, so the, the, the next generation is not able to get into the population. So then you have these trees that just persist and maybe they're big and honking and maybe they can stand you know, being submerged for a while, but they can't stand being submerged for years upon years upon years, so then they die. So we have these ghost forests. So this is this hollowing out, this Swiss cheesing out of the Mississippi wetlands, the Delta wetlands, the Louisiana wetlands is a huge problem. And that's a key issue related to Katrina. Um, another one, how are we doing on time here? So I'll, I'll do a couple more slides and we'll, then we'll break for our, our first break, you guys. Um, so just to uh, illustrate that uh, this is really a human dominated system, um, I wanna show you how much infrastructure is here. 
oil and gas run the state of Louisiana. Despite what people might want to tell you, the energy industry runs Louisiana. So for example, here is uh, Louisiana, here's New Orleans, uh, Baton Rouge, the capital's over here, uh, Texas is over here, and here we go. So here's a map, boom. Those are all pipelines from uh, offshore oil and gas uh, wellheads or from, from production sites on land. These are all offshore wells off the coast of Louisiana and, and a little bit of Texas and, and uh, Mississippi and Alabama. These are all the, and so mostly it's, it varies, but, it, but it's mostly oil offshore these days and it's mostly natural gas onshore. So these are all the natural gas wellheads across the state of Louisiana. They are everywhere. They're in the middle of national parks. When we go to a national park, they're in people's backyards. They are everywhere. So this entire state is, is absolutely punctured right, left, up, north, down, south, east, west with a gazillion million uh, oil and gas production wells. Um, and so that, oh yeah, sorry, Sabrina, yeah, please. Are those like the ones that have ever existed or they, those all exist at the same time currently? Uh, those are basically current. Now, now, some of these might be capped, but these are all wellheads that are working now or were working in the last decade or two. Jeez. Yeah, so, so these aren't, this is not like 1890 wellhead kind of thing. Yeah, it is, it's hard to explain how how big an influence oil and gas production um, have on the state and the, and the culture and the conceptualization and the cultural identity. Um, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a very different world uh, than what we're used to here in California. California, we're still, I believe the four, I believe we're the fourth greatest producer of oil and gas in the States. So, um, be wrong with that. I think, I think we're fourth. The numbers change for, fairly frequently, but but so we're you know we're we're fairly high. We used to be number one back in the day, but we're not even close. We're orders of magnitude less than uh, Louisiana. So they are really the the Louisiana and Alaska really run the show uh, for the most part in terms of gross quantity of hydrocarbons um, sucked out of the ground. Sorry, I have one more question. Yeah, do, yeah please. Do lose the, the people who live here, do they get subsidies like the Alaskans do for this kind of stuff? Okay, subsidies. So that's or a maybe good not, question. Maybe not yeah. subsidies, but that... Um, the payout? Yeah. No. So Alaska set up... So, okay, so what Sabrina's talking about is the folks in Alaska, um, the idea was we did Prudhoe Bay, the North Slope, the oil production all in the north part of the, of the state and had to bid, build, build, excuse me, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline to bring those hydrocarbons from the hard to get to often iced in port areas of the North Slope down to the Southern part of Alaska where it's easier to, to get ships and, and to, to you know, get at that oil, um, huge endeavor. And the idea was, okay, this is a public resource. Uh, so therefore we're going to you know, charge the oil companies some amount of money. Uh, and then we're gonna put that money into a trust, a trust fund, right? Just like we might have a donor that might give money for a scholarship for us. And so, um, so the interest every year, there's a payout that's made to every resident of Alaska. I think you have to be a resident, I could be wrong about this, but I think it's six months. I think you have to be a resident of the state for at least six months <clears throat> and then you can officially register and then you get a check every year. So uh, how much is it these days? I don't know what the current, what happened in the last COVID with oil prices and stuff up there. But, but in years past, it's something on the order of a couple thousand bucks to each person in Alaska. A um, uh, huge issue with that as a side note, because our, our friends up there, University of Alaska, essentially they're the university sta you know, state school, the, the budget is tied to the oil revenues. And it's fine when the oil revenues are going up, but when they're tanking, they have massive cuts to their university system um, and it happens fairly frequently. Um, so that's a huge problem. They do not have anything like that here in Louisiana. So Louisiana, a very poor state. That's the only thing we have to get our head around as we start to talk about what happened with Katrina. Very poor, uh, not very good infrastructure, not a lot of uh, 
huge social safety nets or anything like that. Um, so in this case, most of these, for example, the uh, orange dots are private land. So people have, have leased out their land to the, to the oil companies um, or the oil companies have purchased the land and then they're, they're putting the wells themselves. The offshore stuff is mostly uh, managed as with us, it, it, it's in federal waters. So if you're more than three nautical miles offshore, you're into federal waters. So those are handled by the organization used to be known as Minerals Management Service until Deepwater Horizon. Deepwater Horizon uh, is a huge fiasco. And then the wake of Deepwater Horizon, um, it, uh, it, it, that agency is broken up into two different agencies, BOEM and BESI. So one becomes the safety uh, uh, entity and the other becomes the leasing entity. But basically what happens here is if you wanna drill an oil and gas well over here, it's, you, you make a bid for, to the feds and whoever has the highest bid, um, you, though, that money goes to the, to the um, um, federal treasury. So um, to go into the budget of the US. But uh, yeah, there's no, there's no benefit. There's, there's no payout, annual payout or anything like that for folks in Louisiana. They, they basically gave away, the, they gave away the cash cow to the industry in, in this case. Um, okay, how are we doing on time? Uh, let's, let's, let's do this next uh, slide or so, and then we'll take a break. So, okay, so wetland loss is a huge part of the story of Hurricane Katrina. Why are we losing so much wetland in this part of the country? As we mentioned, first and foremost, there's the subsidence. Subsidence is just where we have a certain level of the soil horizon, soil surface, and it gets lower. That's what subsidence means, goes, goes down. Some of this is just natural and inherent, but the rate of subsidence is dramatically increased because of the massive amount of oil and gas extraction. To a slightly lesser extent, also some freshwater pumping. But again, it's this huge extraction. And, the, um, uh, and there's, there's some other effects of oil and gas extraction that make this worse. But for now, we're just talking about sucking out the, the volume of material, subsurface material. And so as we suck a bunch of stuff out, it, it lowers. Same thing has been happening, for example, in the California Central Valley. Um, there, primarily, it's not oil and gas is doing it, it's sucking out the groundwater. So if you recall during the last drought, there were some studies that showed that some parts of the Central Valley have dropped in elevation by a foot just because of all the um, aquifer water we've sucked out for agriculture. Um, okay, so one, we have the ground going down. Two, we have the ocean coming up. So just as we've talked about, sea level rise is happening all around. Again, there's some natural inherent, very slow level of, of, of sea level rise, but we're, we're massively making that more intense and crazier thanks to global climate change. And as we've talked about, um, you know, we're talking, we've historically talked about a meter or so of, for Cal in California, a meter or so of sea level rise um, here in California. And now we're understanding that, yeah, really we should be talking more about realistically probably a, at least a two meter rise by 2100. That's California, right? Steep cliffs, Thousand Oaks, uh, 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 Agoura Hills, hills of Malibu, hills around Santa Barbara, right? Sort of big topography. That is not this part of the country. This part of the country is flat, 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 flat. So, so even a little bit of sea rise, hugely problematic. Next, we've added, so okay, so those things, those two factors, subsidence and sea level, as processes, those are always going on before humans ever came into the picture. We've made them, made the rates change a lot, but the basic things of so the ground start, starting to sink or the ground sinking, wanting to sink, compress, and sea level rising, that would be going down without people here. We've just massively changed the rates of that. But there's also some novel stressors, some things that did not exist before people were around. First and foremost, these levees. So we've taken the natural river levees that were a few feet high kind of thing and raised them up massively. So the raising of the levees um, is a huge stressor. And that, again, really started in the wake of those 1920s hurricanes. And those, again, exacerbate, those cut off the sediment supply, they cut off the nourishment to the marsh plain. Then we've introduced critters like the guy on the right here. This is a nutria. This is uh, a, a 
large, about the size of a, a raccoon kind of critter, introduced from South America, voracious, absolutely voracious eater of vegetation. So these guys, um, these guys were introduced. The lore is that they were they were brought in to be used for. Um, well, they were brought in for uh, fur for the fur trade, but the lore is that one hurricane struck and broke loose a nutria farm, and then the nutria got out. It probably wasn't that. It was probably over. It was probably the fact that the fur industry was just tanking. You couldn't make money, so people just kind of let them go, right? Um, regardless, these individuals were introduced in the 1930s, and their populations have just exploded. These guys eat away little chunks. They eat so much vegetation, they'll go to an area and start eating, eating, and they'll create a little bear patch. And that little bear patch becomes the center of erosion of the marsh. So they, they, they help jumpstart all these little points where the salt marsh can start to erode. So a huge problem. And then on top of that, we have things like Hurricane Katrina. So this, this um, again, was always here, but we're, with climate change, we're intensifying our, our um, hurricanes. We're, we seem to be making this hurricane season go longer and longer. Um, so we're making that worse. Subsidence, sea level rise, levees, nutria, day in and day out. This stuff is poke, 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 poking the wetlands. Hurricanes are obviously much more pulsed, so they only come along every so often but they're, they're all dramatic. All of these factors are, are, are behind wetland loss. Ultimately, how do we respond to this? We need to first and foremost, add tons of sediment. We need to get sediment back on these systems. Um, and you'll see how, what, what this, how this plays into uh, Katrina in a moment. But, but so we need to add sediment. How do we do that? Break those levees, br br somehow get the sediment from the river you know, to the, the land area. So we can either break the levees, or take them down, or put diversions in. Diversions are kind of like that wood screw we talked about, but instead of pumping um, water uh, you know, into Lake Pontchartrain, you would, the idea is you pump sediment-rich water over the levee and then into the area uh, on the, the landward side, let's say, of the levee so that you can bring sediment-rich uh, water into that area. The water goes away and the sediment drops. We could also reduce oil, water, and gas extraction. We could also take care of the nutria. And there's some people that argue we can fertilize, somehow fertilize or stimulate plant growth so the plants grow. More plants, the more they're able to trap sediment, they're more efficient. Um, but, but various ideas, the most important thing is we need to add a massive amount of sediment back into the system where we've removed it. Instead, what's going on now is that sediment is shooting straight out in the Gulf of Mexico and coming along with a gazillion million pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer from all these Midwest farms. And that sediment plus nutrients are causing the oxygen minimum zone, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So by not having that sediment go where we need it for healthy wetlands, we're both causing a problem for the wetlands, causing a risk for people, uh, they're at greater risk of hurricanes and things of that nature, and we're causing problems in the offshore marine environment. So we cause all kinds of problems with that stuff. Okay, I think we will, yeah. So this is a good place to take a pause. Let's take a quick 10 minute break um, and we'll come back and talk about how, so that was all set up. That was all sort of taking us to the start of Katrina. That's the setting that the storm is gonna arrive in in 2005. And I will see everybody in 10 minutes. <laughs> 